Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. A lawsuit over pro-abortion protests held outside the homes of Supreme Court justices. A group is asking why the Justice Department is refusing to enforce a law restricting such protests. The debate between candidates for the next Michigan governor saw incumbent Democrat Governor Gretchen Whitmer and Trump-backed challenger Tudor Dixon spar fiercely. One of the most pivotal Senate races in the midterm elections. Two former state attorneys general are competing against each other in Nevada. A congressman has requested an investigation into a White House request that Saudi Arabia delay oil production cuts until after the midterms. The Justice Department is facing a lawsuit over protests that took place earlier this year outside the homes of Supreme Court justices. A conservative group is demanding documents. Here are the details. D.C.-based think tank the Heritage Foundation filed a lawsuit against the Justice Department on Wednesday in a federal court in Washington, D.C. The group says it's because the DOJ refuses to explain why it will not enforce a federal law on protests. The law says it's illegal to picket or parade near a residence of a judge with the intent of influencing any judge in the discharge of his duty. The Heritage Foundation says the DOJ is not protecting conservative Supreme Court justices from pro-abortion protests outside their homes. The think tank says they have requested documents from the DOJ under the Freedom of Information Act, but the department did not comply. The think tank is now seeking those documents through the lawsuit. The Heritage Foundation said, quote, The Biden DOJ's silence on these radical protests and obviously intimidating tactics was and remains to be deafening. The American people deserve to know why Joe Biden and Attorney General Merrick Garland not only refused to publicly and unequivocally condemn this behavior, but also why they continue not to prosecute or hold accountable those who facially broke the law in an attempt to influence the proceedings of the Supreme Court. In May, a Supreme Court draft opinion on Roe v. Wade was leaked. Protests soon began at the homes of the six conservative-leaning justices in Maryland and Virginia. Then White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki refused to condemn the protests, but insisted that President Biden supports peaceful protest. A California man was arrested in June near Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home. He was allegedly planning to assassinate the justice to prevent him from voting to overturn Roe v. Wade. On to news that involves former President Trump. A longtime associate of the Clinton family admits under oath that he lied about having insider information from a Republican. The information eventually made its way onto the Steele dossier. Charles Dolan said he invented the supposed GOP source and instead got the information off of cable news. The Steele dossier was partially funded by the Clinton campaign and included numerous allegations about Trump that have since been discredited. Dolan told special counsel John Durham's team in August 20. 2021 that no information in the dossier was attributable to him. But in December 2021, he realized a part may have originated with him, so he alerted investigators. The testimony is part of the trial of Igor Danchenko, who was a key source for the dossier. He is on trial for allegedly lying to FBI agents. With the midterm elections quickly approaching, debates between nominees are heating up. In Michigan's race for governor, Democrat and Governor Gretchen Whitmer took to the stage yesterday against her challenger, Trump-backed nominee Tudor Dixon. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more from the first of two debates. None of what my opponent just said is true. It just isn't. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer wants voters to take her word for it. But both gubernatorial candidates say the other is prone to lying. She just is completely making that up. The two battled it out on hot topic issues like abortion, gun control, and public health. She said she wanted to make abortion a felony, no exceptions for rape, incest, or health of the woman, and throw doctors and nurses in jail. That is too extreme and too dangerous. Dixon denied Whitmer's claims and says her position on abortion is clear. I've never said that I wanted to criminalize people. I've never said I wanted this to be a felony. I am pro-life with exceptions for life of the mother. Dixon is a former steel industry executive and conservative commentator. She has not yet held public office. Whitmer called her ideas dangerous. We cannot trust our future to dangerous people who peddle conspiracy theories, to people for whom problems are more politically valuable and solutions. As for Dixon, she had a similar view about the incumbent governor and her policies. Radical, dangerous, and destructive. Crime is up, 
jobs are down, schools are worse, and the roads didn't get fixed. That's what happens when you hire a radical career politician. You go in the wrong direction. Whitmer fiercely defended her actions during her term. You're going to hear a lot of divisive rhetoric and a focus on the past from my opponent. She says if Dixon had been governor during the pandemic, thousands more would have died. Dixon disagreed, saying Whitmer's lockdowns hurt small businesses, the statewide economy, and stopped kids from attending school. Do not be deceived. This is a woman who shut down the state and had to have her powers, her powers, removed by the Supreme Court. Do not trust her with another four years to terrorize you. The outcome of the governor's race has implications outside the state. With Michigan being a presidential election battleground, the winner could influence voting laws and how the 2024 election is conducted. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. More on the November midterms, Nevada has one of the nation's most pivotal Senate races. The results could ultimately decide which party controls the Senate. Let's take a look. In Nevada, Republican Adam Laxalt is challenging incumbent Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. According to an array of analysis and projections, this toss-up race is one of the four most competitive Senate races in 2022. Laxalt is pounding away at Cortez Masto and President Biden on economic uncertainties, inflation, and energy policy. He's also appealing to fellow veterans on national security issues. In comparison, Cortez Masto touts the Biden administration's response to rising food and fuel costs. She's also vowing to defend access to abortion and accusing Laxalt of being an election denier. What's unique is both Laxalt and Cortez Masto were once Nevada's attorney general. Cortez Masto served from 2006 to 2014 before winning the Senate seat in 2016, and Laxalt immediately succeeding her from 2014 to 2018. Both candidates are trotting out their law enforcement endorsements. They say the endorsements show their commitment to fighting crime while serving as Nevada attorney general. Cortez Masto has the endorsement of the Nevada Police Union, and Laxalt has the endorsement of former President Trump, as well as the Public Safety Alliance of Nevada. This alliance represents over 100 state and local organizations and switched their endorsement from Cortez Masto to Laxalt following the primary. Polls among recent voters in September show the Republican posting 1 to 4 percentage point leads. That's usually within the margin of error. Between both candidates and national groups, the race has drawn more than $130 million in campaign contributions and will likely top $200 million by Election Day. It's the midterm's second most expensive Senate election following Georgia. According to their Federal Election Commission filings, Cortez Masso's campaign had raised $30 million, and Laxalt's campaign had raised $7 million as of July 1st. Where disaster and elections meet, Florida's governor is easing voting rules for residents hit hard by Hurricane Ian. Governor Ron DeSantis issued an executive order that extends early voting and allows voters to cast ballots at any precinct instead of just where they are assigned if they vote on Election Day. The changes apply to Lee, Charlotte, and Sarasota counties. Residents there can also request mail-in ballots to be sent to addresses other than their homes. They can cast ballots at early voting sites right up until Election Day. In other counties, those sites must shut down the day before Election Day. Attacks against Republicans have increased since President Biden's controversial speech in Philadelphia about a month and a half ago. The White House says it condemns the attacks. Here's the story. There have been reports of high-profile acts of political violence against Republicans and conservatives since President Biden's heated speech in Philadelphia last month. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. It isn't clear if Biden's speech motivated acts of vandalism or politically motivated attacks, but several Republican offices across the country have been vandalized since then. The chairman for the Ottawa County Republican Party in Michigan spoke to local media about an incident last week. He said that officials came out and found that all their signs had been hacked to pieces, their building had been vandalized, and the permanent sign on the outside of the building had been torn up. Also in Michigan, an 80-year-old pro-life canvasser going door-to-door -door was shot after a heated verbal argument. A man was charged with felony assault and reckless discharge of a firearm. The suspect came forward last week, telling a local TV station that he shot Jacobson accidentally as she was arguing with his wife, who supports abortion. And last month, an 18-year-old young man was killed in North Dakota when a man allegedly hit him with his vehicle. The suspect later told a 911 dispatcher that he thought the victim was part of an extremist Republican group. He was charged with murder in the teen's death.
Republican Senator of Kentucky Rand Paul told Fox News, President Biden needs to realize that his vilification of his opponents is inflaming some of his supporters to violence. Paul also said, as a victim of political violence, both sides need to recognize the consequences of heated rhetoric. Senator Paul was physically attacked by his neighbor in 2017 and attacked by rioters after the 2020 Republican National Convention. In a recent comment about political violence, a White House spokesperson told Fox News that President Biden condemns these attacks and has been clear that violence, threats of violence, and vandalism are absolutely unacceptable, regardless of who is committing such acts or why. He added that there's no place in America for political violence. Former President Trump denounces the January 6th committee after it votes unanimously to subpoena him. He then writes a letter to the committee chairman. Trump asked on Truth Social why the committee waited it until it was about to wrap up to try and subpoena him. He says it's, quote, because the committee is a total bust and that has only served to further divide our country. Chairman Benny Thompson said the committee recognizes how serious and extraordinary the step to subpoena Trump is and claimed that Trump's testimony would make sure, quote, nothing like January 6th ever happens again. The subpoena is unlikely to succeed since it will likely prompt legal challenges from Trump's attorneys. Trump addressed a letter to Thompson in response. His main points were that the committee is ignoring why so many people came to the Capitol in the first place, which was a belief the election was a fraud, and also that he called for putting the National Guard in place much sooner, but it was rejected. Election integrity efforts by grassroots organizations are rising to a whole new level for this year's midterms. We hear from one of them on their task forces and how regular citizens can become involved. Joining us now is Jenny Beth Martin, co-founder of Tea Party Patriots and honorary chairwoman of Tea Party Patriots Action. Great to have you on the show, Jenny. Thanks so much for having me. Your organization has trained over 7,500 people on election integrity in several states. Can you tell us more about what you're doing across the country? What we've been doing for the last um, year at this point is training people to, to start local or county level election integrity task forces. And those task forces have different things to work on. Right now, as we head into the election, the most important thing for them to be working on is recruiting poll, poll watchers and where um, lo- localities are working to still hire people to work the elections, hiring poll workers as well. That's excellent. So what can you tell us about what poll workers need to know in terms of what they can and can't do? So a poll worker is a person who is working inside the precinct. They're trained by the local government in in most instances. And when a voter comes in, they check the voter off of a poll pad. They give them either their ballot or the card they insert into the touchscreen device. And then that ballot marking device, the the voter goes and and casts their ballot. And then when they finish entering what they want for their ballot, the poll worker will guide them to where the ballot box is they insert the ballot into the box. And then at the end of the day, the voter inserts the ballot into the box. And then at the end of the day, the poll worker will close down the location. So it's important if your local election office is still working to hire people to, if they're still looking to hire people to work the polls, give them a call, find out if they are. And if they are, ask what you need to do to sign up to be a poll worker. It may be called an inspector of elections or a judge of elections elections or an election official and your local election office will be able to help you with that. And these midterms are seeing a lot of these election integrity efforts. Why now? Um, Well, I think a lot of it is because there was so much distrust about the integrity of the election after the 2020 election on on the Republican side. But remember, in 2018 and even in 2016, there was a lot of distrust in the outcome of the election among Democrats. And so I think most Americans who are worried and don't completely trust the outcome of the elections realize this is not a good place for America to be. We can't be a society where we just go, oh yeah, cheating happens, no big deal. It always happens in every election. Or um, be okay with the fact that we don't trust the outcome of the election. And there are people across the country who are saying, I don't, I don't know if I trust everything that happened in 2020, but I want to make sure I trust it in 2022 and beyond. And that's why they're getting involved. And we've strived to take all the that passion and emotion and concern and worry and fear about the country, especially in terms of of election integrity and turn it into meaningful action. 
So you mentioned things like distrust and cheating. What are the most important things to be done to restore faith in the elections? Well, I think the most important thing that we can do as citizens, uh, that means we're not attorneys, we're not law enforcement, we, we're not a candidate, we're just regular citizens, is exercise the our rights within the law and our given state and locality. And what I mean by that is that w- there are laws in place in every state around the country for people to become poll watchers. Those are the people who observe the election. They're not allowed to talk, but they can watch what is happening in report problems if they see problems by stepping outside the precinct or at the end of election day. Um, getting involved, we've got people across the country who are working to clean election rolls to make sure that the people who are registered to vote in any given location actually live in those lo- that location and are indeed the qualified to be a registered voter in that location. Sometimes people forget to um, to move their move their voter registration when when they actually move. So just making sure the rolls are clean, working to get to know your elect um, your election office workers. So the people who work in the office and befriend them, find out if they need help and if they do volunteer to help them. There are a lot of different things that we can do as citizens and that we're legally not just entitled to do, but we're supposed to be doing because oftentimes it's those that citizen oversight, like with poll watchers that um, puts the guardrails in place to ensure that our elections run honestly and transparently. Very important topic, and this is right around the corner. Jenny Beth Martin, Tea Party Patriots, great speaking with you today. Thanks for having me. A group of New York Republicans wants the Justice Department to investigate the state's attorney general. A former South Carolina governor says the AG leaked a list of donors. Nikki Haley has served as South Carolina governor and then U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. She says New York Attorney General Letitia James is responsible for leaking a list of private donors of Haley's policy advocacy group. In a letter to U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, a group of House Republicans expressed their concern over the leak and said it could violate federal law. Politico publicized the stand for America Group's 2019 tax return, disclosing the list of donors that is normally held secret. A stamp from the New York Attorney General's charity office appeared on the last page of the leaked filings. Haley accused James's office of breaking tax laws and saw it as an attempt to intimidate conservative donors. A U.S. House of Representative is questioning whether the Biden administration coordinated with a foreign government to influence the midterm elections. The representative now wants the situation to be investigated. Representative Tom Tiffany is requesting an investigation into a White House request that Saudi Arabia delay oil production cuts until after the midterms. The representative on Thursday urged House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to investigate the issue. In a statement, Tiffany said, These are very serious allegations, and if the Biden administration did, in fact, attempt to coordinate with a foreign government to influence the U.S. election, that's something the American people deserve to know. Tiffany's request comes after Saudi Arabia's foreign minister suggested in an official statement on Wednesday that the Biden administration asked the kingdom to postpone the cut's decision for a month. In a letter to Pelosi, the representative said that if the claim is true, it may very well constitute an illegal solicitation of a foreign and kind contribution by the White House on behalf of Democrats' midterm campaign efforts. He also demands that the White House immediately release the transcript from the last month of any calls between the Biden administration and Saudi officials. According to the New York Post, White House officials on Thursday confirmed that they asked Saudi Arabia to delay cuts until the next OPEC meeting in December, saying there was no market basis to cut production targets. NTD reached out to the White House for comment on Tiffany's allegations but didn't hear back before broadcast. A federal judge in West Virginia blocked a federal law that banned guns with the serial numbers removed. He ruled that firearms with the serial number filed off should still be considered legal under the Constitution. A judge cited a recent Supreme Court decision that holds the constitutional right to bear arms as fundamental. He says that guns without serial numbers are more likely to be used in a violent crime, but he adds that this is reasoning backwards from the ends to the means and not part of applying law. He says his is the first federal court to address the serial numbers issue. 
A fifth grade teacher in Indiana has been detained by police after it was discovered that she had a kill list that included her own students and school staff members. 25-year-old teacher Angelica Casarquillo Torres worked at St. Stanislaus School in East Chicago, Indiana. Police officers spoke with the principal and the assistant principal who claimed that the teacher allegedly told a fifth grade student about her kill list and informed the student that he or she was on the bottom of that list. Police say the student told a counselor about the list and the teacher was immediately taken to the principal's office. She allegedly admitted to the existence of the list. Police say the principal then advised the teacher to leave and not return to school pending an investigation. The East Chicago Police Department says they were informed of the situation roughly four hours after the teacher was allowed to leave the school and go home, and they were then able to obtain an emergency detention order to arrest the teacher. A South Carolina attorney accused of killing his family will stand trial this coming January. The state attorney general says Alec Murdoch's trial is scheduled to begin on January 30th and will last about two weeks. Murdoch faces multiple charges, including two counts of murder in connection to the deaths of his wife Maggie and his son Paul. They were found shot to death in the family's home more than a year ago. Murdoch has denied involvement in their deaths, saying he was visiting his mother when they were killed. The U.S. Embassy in South Africa is issuing a travel warning to Americans visiting the country. This is after a foreign tourist was recently murdered there. According to media reports last week, armed assailants stopped a tour group as it made its way to South Africa's famed Kruger National Park. A German tourist was shot and killed in a robbery. The U.S. Embassy is asking Americans to be aware when traveling in the area and only make stops at designated areas such as service stations and garages. The Assembly is also recommending Americans avoid the gate where the murder took place. The embassy notes that there is a rise in crime and protests and road closures are frequent in the area. South Africa's crime rate has soared in recent years amid exceptionally high unemployment rates. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, a French member of the EU Parliament says she plans to sue the European Commission president. It's over alleged corruption in the purchase of billions of doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. For gambling addicts in Australia, mobile phone gambling makes it harder than ever to resist placing bets. Get the details in just a minute here on NTD News. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So I'll see you there. As Americans, it seems like other people have been telling us what to do, how to live, and how to think. But that's not how we founded the greatest nation on Earth. During times of powerlessness, we found power. And we found power through taking action. Through action, we find solutions. And through solutions, we find freedom. The supply shortage has made it harder than ever to keep your shooting skills sharp at the range. Introducing Strikeman, a laser firearm training system that allows you to practice your shooting skills at home without wasting a dime on ammo. Using our laser cartridge, target, phone mount, and award-winning phone app, become a proficient shooter in under two weeks. Create training templates with firearm drills and get live feedback with progress tracking on your shot accuracy and shot times. Beat personal records and compete with friends and family to crown the best shooter in the group. Put the power back in your hands with Strikeman. Attention Camp Lejeune employees. If you were a contractor or non-military employee who worked at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina prior to 1988 and developed any of these cancers or suffered any of these injuries, you may be eligible for significant financial compensation. Leaking underground tanks contaminated the drinking water with benzene and other highly carcinogenic chemicals. Call Camp Lejeune victims to discuss your case now. If you don't win, you pay nothing. 800-245-2189.
Welcome back. Several members of the EU Parliament have raised questions over the purchase of over 4 billion doses of Pfizer's COVID vaccine and the way the contracts were signed by the EU Commission president. They accuse her of corruption for concealing the discussions she had with the pharmaceutical company. NTD's France correspondent David Vives has the story. The Croatian Member of Parliament claims that EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen unlawfully concluded the purchase of 4.5 billion doses of the COVID vaccine in total by the EU. 4.5 billion doses for 450 million people, including children, means each EU citizen, which excludes the UK, shall receive 10 doses each of the vaccine. Several other MPs back Kolakusik's claims. In a hearing at the EU Parliament on Monday, lawmakers addressed questions over the contract binding the EU and Pfizer. French MP Virginie Joron noted the refusal of Pfizer CEO Albert Bourla to attend the meeting on October 12th and said none of the EU lawmakers' concerns had been answered on that day. We regret that Mr. Bourla did not attend this hearing. We all know that this is the most important purchase contract carried out by the Commission. The order emitted by von der Leyen has also been questioned in a report by the European Court of Auditors. On September 21st, the court stated it had asked for several documents regarding the participation of the EU Commission president in the negotiation with Pfizer over the purchase of the vaccine doses, but the Commission had turned down this request. Moreover, the report shows the call for tenders to vaccine manufacturers had been emitted by the Commission after it already decided Pfizer would be the contractor. In other words, according to media outlet Le Courrier des Stratèges, the call for tenders only served to normalize an agreement already done by Pfizer and the Commission. Joron says these details, plus the opacity of the negotiations, are enough to sue Ursula von der Leyen over suspicion of corruption. I asked a lawyer firm in France about what we could do, because thanks to this report of the EU Court of Auditors, which has just been published, we have 35 pages of criticisms, demands, lack of transparency. And page 33 is very clear where they indicate that preliminary negotiations were made by Ms. von der Leyen, and that as such she was unprofessional. So a factual report of suspected passive corruption against Ms. von der Leyen will be made. I also ask that it be received by the chief prosecutor. I think that today, given the report, they come, they do not answer anything and continue to sell us their products. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. The spokesman of the EU Commission says, quote, it is true that some details of the contracts can't be made public due to confidentiality, but he adds that, quote, the negotiations have been conducted by the Commission in partnership with delegates of EU countries. On the Commission's website, it says it, quote, has been negotiating intensely to build a diversified portfolio of vaccines for EU citizens at fair prices. And there's growing concern in Australia over the lack of regulation for online betting. COVID-19 lockdowns appear to have pushed many gambling addicts to turn to smartphone apps. Now they can gamble anytime, anywhere. Rhys Wareham is a coffee industry technician from Sydney. He's also a gambling addict. His routine was to head down to the local pub every day to play on the poker machines there. That is, until COVID-19 and lockdowns hit. All the pubs and venues shut up shop. You had no access to poker machines for nine months plus. Um, And the addiction didn't go anywhere, so I kind of turned to sports betting applications um, on my phone. Um, And it's been that way ever since. Unable to reach the machines, he switched to gambling on his phone, meaning he could bet on his favourite sport, baseball, anytime, anywhere. It's a shift that's been seen across Australia in betting behaviour since the pandemic. Gamblers have turned to smartphone apps, exposing them to an industry that's harder to regulate than traditional gambling. A government report released in September 2021 said Australia was the world's biggest gambling nation by losses per capita, losing an estimated 25 billion Australian dollars or about 16 billion US dollars a year. Wareham, a 31-year-old father of two, says he's lost more than $100,000 from gambling. 
Many app providers, which are often offshore-based bookmakers, have ramped up marketing with text message-based promotion offers, sidestepping advertising restrictions. It's just too easy, you know. I, there, there's no reform at all on how much advertising these sports betting companies can spend on their marketing, on their advertising, on their promotions. Wareham says he sees his gambling as shameful, describing his inability to control it as a mental illness that needs support. The concern is echoed by Stu Cameron, CEO of Wesley Mission, which operates the phone counselling service Lifeline. A lot of the calls we get uh, through to our Lifeline services, uh, you know, a proportion of those are people who are suffering through gambling harm and addiction. And so we know that, that, that gambling harm you know, is a precursor to significant mental health challenges, including suicide ideation. For Wareham, the first step in tackling this is to regulate advertising. The less we see it on billboards, the less we see it in ads, the less we see it, it's only going to be the gamblers, gamblers that want to gamble. Just like we can't advertise cigarettes, why the hell can we advertise gambling? The federal government said mid-September that it would hold a wide-ranging parliamentary inquiry into online gambling. However, the main recommendations of a 2015 inquiry on the same subject, which were accepted by the government at the time, are yet to take effect. Wareham says he isn't sure he can kick the gambling addiction completely, but says for now, his online betting habit is under control. He no longer spends a whole paycheck in one sitting. Just ahead, the United Kingdom donates rockets that can shoot down cruise missiles to Ukraine. They are meant to help protect infrastructure. And women in Berlin are donating their wedding dresses to a pop-up store. All the proceeds are sent to support women in Ukraine. We'll have more about that here on NTD News Today. Continuing strikes at French oil refineries have seriously disrupted fuel supplies today. This after the CGT union rejected a deal over a pay increase that two other unions agreed to. Long lines of cars could be seen across France as motorists waited some for hours to fill up. Many gas stations have temporarily closed while awaiting deliveries. About 30 percent of France's gas stations are experiencing temporary shortages. Two other unions representing a majority of the group's French workers agreed overnight to a 7 percent pay raise and a financial bonus. But CGT rejected the deal, holding out for a 10 percent pay increase. Those on strike feel they should have a share of the win fall profits generated by high oil and gas prices amid the global energy crisis. The company announced it will pay out a one-month salary bonus in December of up to $6,000 besides the percentage increase. British Finance Minister Kwasi Kwarteng has confirmed in a tweet that he resigned after Prime Minister Liz Truss asked him to stand aside from the position. His termination on Friday means he was on the job for 38 days, making him the second shortest serving UK Chancellor on record. Member of Parliament Jeremy Hunt was appointed as the new finance minister on Friday, according to a tweet from Number 10 Downing Street. And over in the UK, Royal Mint could cut as many as 5,000 to 6,000 jobs by the end of August next year. The private postal service remains locked in a bitter dispute with its largest labor union and also warned of more layoffs if planned strikes go ahead. The Communication and Workers Union held strikes in September and early October. It represents 115,000 Royal Mail postal workers. It has also threatened more strikes this month and next. Royal Mail urged the union to call off the strikes immediately and begin mediated talks. Following months of failed negotiations, Royal Mail in September proposed, proposed, to, pay the, to, proposed to take the pay dispute to arbitration and change its policies. This angered the union. Royal Mail saw adjusted operating losses of about $240 million in the first half of the year, while losses for the year are expected to come in at around $390 million. And the U.K. plans to send anti-aircraft rockets to Ukraine capable of shooting down cruise missiles. It's an effort to help protect Ukraine's infrastructure against Russia's deadly missile attacks. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has announced that the U.K. will donate some advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles, or AMRAAM, rockets to Ukraine. The rockets are the first donated by Britain that are capable of shooting down cruise missiles. The Defence Secretary said... 
Russia's latest indiscriminate strikes on civilian areas in Ukraine warrant further support to those seeking to defend their nation. The Amram rockets will be delivered in the coming weeks to be used with the NASAM air defense system pledged by the United States. It's hoped the new air defense missiles will help protect Ukrainian infrastructure after Moscow launched a wave of deadly missile and drone attacks on the country's cities and power plants this week. The latest package of UK equipment also includes hundreds of other air defense missiles, aerial drones and a further 18 howitzer artillery guns. Ukraine said it has only about 10% of what it needs for its air defenses, urging the international community to provide more weapons. The defense secretary announced the decision before he left for a NATO defense minister summit in Brussels on Thursday. The military alliance is pressing ahead with plans to hold a nuclear exercise next week. What we don't want is to do things out of routine. Uh, this is a routine exercise and it's all about readiness. NATO's exercise, dubbed Steadfast Noon, is held around the same time every year and runs for about one week. It involves fighter jets capable of carrying nuclear warheads, but doesn't involve any live bombs. Elon Musk warns that the free internet for Ukraine's military could be coming to an end. SpaceX has donated about 20,000 Starlink satellite units to Ukraine. They're helping the country's military communicate after phone and internet networks were destroyed in the war with Russia. Musk says it has cost his company $80 million, and he warned the Pentagon that won't continue. A recently uncovered letter he sent last month asks the U.S. military to pay tens of millions of dollars per month for the service. The letter says not only is SpaceX considering not donating additional new units, it wants the Pentagon to pay to keep the current ones active. That bill would be $400 million over the next 12 months. Sources say Starlink is the main way troops on the battlefield communicate. A U.S. Army veteran and a father of five has been killed in Ukraine. The State Department only confirms that a U.S. citizen has died there, but his sister has identified him as Dane Partridge from Rexburg, Idaho. The 34-year-old had been fighting alongside the Ukrainians since the end of April. Last week, when Partridge and some other men were clearing trenches in eastern Ukraine, they were ambushed by two Russian vehicles. Partridge was shot in the head and died in the hospital Tuesday. His body is on its way back to the U.S where he'll be buried in a VA cemetery in Idaho. And a group of women in Berlin has come up with a new way to fundraise for Ukraine. They're donating their wedding dresses to a pop-up store. Entity's Andrew Thomas has more on their efforts. At this pop-up store in Berlin, these donated dresses will be sold to raise money for women in Ukraine. The founder of the store, Anna Saraste, is a Finnish journalist living in Berlin. She already donated money to organizations in Ukraine, but she wanted to do more. During summertime, I was going through my closet and sorting out again uh, different things, and I came across my wedding dress once more. And that's when I decided, okay, this dress needs to go. Mm, I could sell that and give the money to Ukraine. That's great. Berlin resident Laura Benedetti is getting married next year. She just started looking for a dress when she came across an ad for dresses for Ukraine. I just uh, found it on Facebook, the event, and I thought it was, uh, yeah, a good uh, thing to combine uh, the look, looking for a dress and also for a good reason, like spending for, for Ukraine. The Berlin team is working on selling as many dresses as they can. They also hope that people in other cities will start their own organizations. Well, one idea that we would definitely like to pass on from this action is that it could be easily replicated also in other places, um, in Europe uh, and elsewhere, because there's a lot of women who have, um, for big money, gotten a wedding dress and that never do anything with it afterwards. Irina Bilkina is a refugee from Ukraine. She helps model the dresses for the website. If you actually, you are supposed to spend this kind of money, it's much better that they are like for a good cause than for your wardrobe, but I don't know. All the proceeds from the sales will be sent to two separate groups to support women in Ukraine. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Europe's top court ruled on Thursday that EU companies can ban headscarves at work as long as it's a general prohibition that does not discriminate against employees. 
A case concerned Muslim woman who was told she could not wear a headscarf when she applied to a six-week training program at a Belgian company. The firm said it has a neutrality rule, meaning no head covering is allowed in its premises, whether a cap, beanie, or scarf. The woman took her grievance to a Belgian court, which subsequently sought advice from the Court of Justice of the European Union. The top European court said there is not direct discrimination in such a ban because it is applied to all workers. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, a scientific mission is underway to learn more about the lives of tiger sharks in the Maldives. The island nation is home to one of the largest populations of the species in the world. And does a goldfish only have three seconds of memory? A new study coming out of Oxford University is challenging the old saying. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. church has been invaded. By whom? The same ideology that's attacking our state, Marxism. Hi, my name is Lucas Miles. I'm an ordained minister and best-selling author. The Bible says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Over the past decade, I've traveled around the world from Nairobi to DC, Los Angeles to Kuala Lumpur, sharing the gospel with anyone who would listen. As a young pastor, I was wooed by Christian socialism and its so-called utopian ideals. But I soon realized that its ideas are unbiblical and its progressive policies are destructive. As socialists, we know the answer is class struggle. Now, I'm tirelessly exposing the dangers of Marxist ideology in the church and unveiling the truth about the agenda of the last. Some of this is gonna be difficult to watch. I just wanna warn you up front about that. Throwing it literally in human feces, this is a hate crime. He said God acted like an older white man with absolute power. He's abandoned God. They want a church that bows down to the state. They want a church that worships the state. Because I realize that if I don't start getting political, that I'm not going to be able to be spiritual. So if you want to stay informed on the most critical issues regarding religious freedom and the Christian faith, then you've come to the right place. This is Church and State. I love you! Good to have you back with us. The National Park Service is taking action to protect California's giant sequoias. According to the Park Service, up to 19% of the world's sequoia population was destroyed in the past two years. Starting today, park rangers will thin vegetation and use small prescribed fires to protect 11 sequoia groves at high risk. While the giant trees actually thrive in small forest fires, recent fires have burned so intensely that it killed many of the majestic trees. Crews will focus their efforts in California's Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. A scientific mission hopes to discover more about the lives of tiger sharks in the Maldives. The island nation is home to one of the largest populations of the species in the world. And Titi's Andrew Thomas has more on the ocean predators. Tiger sharks regularly visit the waters around the Maldives. The apex predators often swim less than 100 yards from the island. Guide Hamna Hussein takes groups of visitors below the surface to see the stunning creatures. Tiger sharks are known to go below thousands of meters, so we don't know what they do. We don't know the radius of their migrations. We don't know whether our pregnant ones are going to give birth. We don't know if we have pups here. We don't know where the mating takes place. There's so many un- un- unanswered questions. Scientists are beginning more research on the tiger sharks. Diving school owner Ahmed Ina is involved in a project to study them. So far we have more than 200 tiger sharks ID, different individuals, so that from what we know that's the healthiest tiger shark population in the world. The true number of tiger sharks here might be as high as 500. 
researchers from the Marine Science Institute, Necton, hope to shed more light on the mysteries of the species. It would help us to understand the topography or like if they could help us a little bit why they're here, uh, you know, why the sharks are around. Not just tigers, you know, threshers, hammerheads, whale sharks. Tiger sharks can grow up to 18 feet long and weigh as much as 2,000 pounds. The species are known for eating a huge range of prey, including fish, seabirds, sea turtles, and rays. They eat almost anything they can catch. The really cool thing about tiger sharks is they have this nickname that's called the trash can of the sea. And with that kind of nickname, they're not that picky. Tiger sharks are considered a near-threatened species, a status that indicates they are not at risk of extinction, but have some vulnerabilities. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Goldfish may actually be smarter and have better memory than we think. A new study shows they can understand their environment quite well. Researchers at the University of Oxford say goldfish can navigate around their surroundings as any land animal would. Scientists trained nine goldfish to travel along a 27-inch water tank. The walls were covered with black and white stripes less than an inch long. Using a wave, scientists prompted the fish to turn around at the required distance and swim back to the start position. And after months of training, the goldfish remembered just how far to go without scientists prompting them. The researchers say the fish can learn how to discriminate between colors and between different numbers. And still to come, the Rose Parade names its next Grand Marshal. Former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords will lead the festivities in 2023. Find out more in just a minute. Former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords is chosen as Grand Marshal for the next Rose Parade. Giffords was shot in the head in Arizona during a public appearance in 2011. Thank you, Amy. I'm so honored to be Grand Master of the Rose Parade. Thank you very, very much. Our lives can change so quickly. Mine did when I was shot. But I never gave up hope. I chose to make a new start, to move ahead, to not look back. I'm relearning so many things, how to walk, how to talk, and I'm fighting to make the country safer. The parade will hold its 134th edition on January 2nd next year. Giffords will also be part of the coin flip for the 109th Rose Bowl football game later that day. The parade's theme of turning the corner represents the world emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic and the sweeping turn the floats and bands make as part of their five and a half mile route. Giffords is a gun safety advocate who received the Presidential Medal of Freedom earlier this year. Giffords' husband is running for re-election to the U.S. Senate and he'll join her during the festivities. Auction House Sotheby's is displaying a collection of eight rare blue diamonds in New York City. They're valued at over $70 million and will be auctioned later this year and next year. What makes it really exceptional is that it's part of this group. Um, It is the De Beers Exceptional Blue Collection. So all we keep focusing on is rarity, the rarity of a blue diamond to begin with, and then to have eight of them in a group is, is unheard of. I've never seen anything like it. The Gemological Institute of America graded the top lot diamond a fancy vivid blue. This is the highest possible color grading, and the Gemological Institute only awards it to less than 1% of blue diamonds submitted to them. Blue diamonds at auction have had an admirable track record. Sotheby's sold a 12-carat fancy vivid blue diamond in 2015 for over $48 million. The largest blue diamond in the collection is over 11 carats. It will be sold in Geneva next month. The rest of the collection will be sold across Sotheby's auction houses in New York, Geneva, and Hong Kong this year and through next spring. A fictional hypersonic jet, Dark Star, was featured impressively in this year's movie Top Gun Maverick. A real-world mock-up of the aircraft is on display this coming weekend. Visitors can catch a glimpse of the mock-up at the Southern California Aerospace Valley Open House, Air Show, and STEM Expo. In the opening of the film, Tom Cruise's character makes a dazzling unauthorized test flight with it, driving the plot to follow. Dark Star is inspired by the SR-71 Blackbird made by Lockheed Martin in the 1960s. This long-range, high-altitude spy plane could fly at three times the speed of sound. The lifelike nature of the Dark Star model is impressive. 
Top Gun producer Jerry Bruckheimer said the Navy informed him that it even fooled the Chinese military into repositioning a satellite for a better observation of it. If you're going to expose your skin to the sun, you need protection, right? We've been using sunscreen for a very long time, but could we be doing more harm than good? Here's Gina Marie, who brings us Strong Mind and Body. The conventional wisdom is to lather sunscreen on our bodies before and during outdoor activities. But what's in these sun creams, and is the concoction of chemicals good for us? Maybe not. Dr. Joseph McCola, osteopathic physician and natural health advocate, believes that sunscreen is widely overused. He says it's a loaded brew of toxic ingredients that pummel human fertility, impair your neurons and threaten coral reefs. Dr. McCola said there are some circumstances where it is wise and appropriate to use, but those cases are few and far between. You just need to avoid sunscreen and rely on sensible sun exposure. In February 2019, the US Food and Drug Administration proposed new regulations to make sure sunscreens are safe and effective. CDC research reveals that 96% of the US adult population have absorbed sunscreen ingredient oxybenzene. In Hawaii, they banned oxybenzene due to serious threats to marine life. The problem is our skin also soaks up these chemicals. Oxybenzene is an endocrine disruptor, reducing male fertility. Many ingredients have been linked to skin cancer of all things, increasing the speed at which malignant cells develop and spread. Some ingredients are neurotoxic, posing risk to brain health. These have appeared in blood, urine and breast milk within two hours of application. Sunscreen filters are associated with reproductive development toxicity and impaired functioning of the thyroid, liver or kidneys. Animal research showed nanoparticles reach all areas of the respiratory tract and possibly the bloodstream. The lungs can't clear these tiny particles. So given all that, let's look at some sensible sun tips. Allow yourself some exposure for short periods to make vitamin D. Use a hat to shield your face. Use clothing to cover up. And finally, make sure your diet is antioxidant rich and include fresh, raw and unprocessed foods. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. only keeps selective videos on its platform. So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.